yeah welcome back um so we kind of started chapter 3 uh, but then you know let's actually look at that um, verse which rosalind mentioned um, that would be this in the second chapter verse 13 uh, so yes i looked it up on the internet and um, um, you have some English translations using the term first fruits, and then there are some English translations which uh, choose to use the phrase from the beginning. God chose you from the beginning. Okay, so, um, and it turns out that the reason is because um, of different manuscripts, you know, this ancient manuscripts from which the English translation was done. Uh, NIV and uh, some of the other. Uh, translations have used one set of um, old manuscripts for their translation work, uh, whereas uh, the other, you know, set of English translations have used a different um, uh, set of ancient manuscripts to do their translation work. I never even thought that we would have to get into this, you know, issue here right now at the, at the very end of our session. Uh, but then just to touch upon that, uh, it, it helps to know these things. Um, um, OK. Uh, in, in the 1600s, when KJV, you know, the English translation was done, um, the manuscripts which were available at that time, you know, whatever ancient manuscripts that they had, the most original uh, manuscripts that they had available at that time, the handwritten copies, you know, which were available, um, they used that to do the English translation. So that was the most reliable, uh, you know, source which they had in, in their hands at that time. Uh, later on, those particular, those, those ancient documents, uh, those manuscripts, uh, those handwritten copies, you know, of the Old and New Testaments, uh, those came to be called the Byzantine um, um manuscripts and then um it was in um, sometime in the 1900s that um people discovered other even more ancient documents uh, which are called the alexandrian manuscripts so uh, these alexandrian manuscripts are more ancient than the byzantine manuscripts and uh, so uh, the difference which they noticed between the Byzantine manuscripts and the Alexandrian manuscripts is basically that um, in the Byzantine manuscripts, there are a lot of extra words. So whereas in the Alexandrian manuscripts, which are more ancient, there are fewer words. And when I say more words and fewer words, I'm talking about like maybe an additional, um, I don't remember anymore maybe an additional 700 words or so. And so uh, people said that as time was passing by, you know, people might have attached an extra word here and there just to clarify, just to make the text a little more, you know, easy to understand. And that is how the extra wordings might have crept into the manuscripts, you know, while people were, make, while, while, while were doing their handwritten copies. So people began to say that the Alexandrian manuscripts, because they are more ancient and more original, it's better to trust them and use them to do translation work rather than using the Byzantine uh, uh, documents, which have a lot of extra things attached, which is why you know, when, you, when you basically look at your NIV translation, they will not include certain Bible passages because those were not there in the more ancient Alexandrian manuscripts. There's a lot of debate going on regarding that whole thing. So we will not even touch upon that. But you can read upon it on the internet. It's quite interesting uh, to talk uh, where they will explain to you the differences between the Byzantine manuscripts and the Alexandrian manuscripts. So it, this, this seems to be the case over here. All the English translations which, you, which chose to use the Alexandrian manuscripts and some of the other manuscripts, they have uh, you know, used the manuscripts where the word first fruits was used. On the other hand, the other manuscripts which have the wording from the beginning, uh, English translations which have used those manuscripts have come up with this translation. So it's actually a, it's called a textual variation. Depending on which ancient text you were using, 
to do your translation, uh, there is a variation in the text. This happens extremely rarely. So it's not really something that we need to worry about. Um, so um, there is a clear distinction. Yes, there are some manuscripts which have the wording for first fruits, and there are some which have the wording um, from the uh, ancient times. So those are the two different. Uh, yeah, so that so the variation has come because of that, and of course, people who say that you know uh, the wording first fruits is more relevant, they'll build up a case to explain uh, why that term first fruits was used by Paul, and uh, that was the explanation which I had read, and uh, so that is what I have explained. And then there are others who you know prefer the wording uh, the from the beginning, and then they have their own argument for why that. Is probably the more reliable, uh, you know, version. So we, so I just wanted to clarify that, and we will leave it at that because there's a lot of debate surrounding, you know, which is the more correct, uh, you know, version, uh, and we don't really need to get into that now. Um, so uh, we, in our chapter three, we looked at uh, Paul's request that he and his team should be delivered from wicked and evil people. Uh, based on that, we can say that it is all right for us to pray against the wicked strategies of evil people who are persecuting the church. We can pray and say, Lord, do not allow those people to win. Rather, allow your church to go forth and accomplish all it's meant to and not to be restricted and limited by these wicked and evil people. Uh, so uh, Paul assures them that if we pray in this manner, the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen us and he will protect us from the evil one. Um, yeah. Then uh, coming to verses um, 6, maybe we can go up to verse 11. Yeah. If some, we could have someone read out for us uh, verses 6 to 11, please. Verse 6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother. Yeah. Did, have I lost verse my connection? Six, verse verse, oh, yeah. from verse yeah. 6, right, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. I could not hear you, sir. That I lost my connection. I was worried. Go ahead. But we... But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you... Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we, we can pause over there. Yes, thank you. So, uh, you know, this is something that we have dwelt upon before. Um, he says, you know, um, um, that everyone should work hard and earn uh, and support themselves and not just depend upon others. Here he says, keep away from every believer. Uh, so he goes further. And in fact, he repeats this you know, in one of the latter verses. So he says, actually, he actually is saying, don't associate with them. You know, uh, for a, at least for a temporary amount of time, um, kind of socially boycott them, you know, is what he is saying. Because he, um, he brings out that in verse 14. OK, so he's actually asking uh, the church to boycott such people uh, for a temporary amount of time so that these people will realize that what they are doing is serious. 
God expects each person to uh, work and support themselves. So uh, he says, uh, Paul says, this is the kind of example which we set for you. Uh, he says in verse 9, you know, that we as apostles had the authority if we had wanted to request support from you. Because after all, you know, we are uh, working uh, for you, for your sake uh, as apostles. So we could have used our authority to ask you to support us. However, we have not done that. Um, so he says, um, we chose to, you know, uh, to support ourselves. He says, he explains, in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. So they were deliberately setting an example for the Thessalonians and showing them that it is good for us to, uh, to, to rely upon ourselves and support ourselves. So he says in verse 8, we did not eat anyone's food without paying for it. So in the same way, he is telling these people, you also should work and support yourselves. So in verse 10, uh, he says, the one uh, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So they deliberately forego uh, the right to support so that they can set this example for the people that if you um, don't work, you should not eat. So the apostles, even though they were in full-time ministry, they also work so that they may pay and eat rather than you know taking the food uh, free from people. Uh, so they, uh, they went to this extent to set an example because they felt it was very, very important for the church to understand this uh, because the world is watching and the world should not think of the church as a lazy, irresponsible set of people. Uh, so it is very important that we should be uh, presenting the right example and the right witness to those who are watching us. And so in verse 14, he says, uh, take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. So if anyone is refusing to follow this instruction, which we are giving, he says, take special note of them. You know, earlier he said, keep away from them. And again, he repeats that he says, do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. The idea is not to, you know, completely um, cut them off from the church. No, the idea is just to shame them and make them realize that what they are doing is not honorable. And that is why he says in verse 15, yet do not regard them as an enemy, uh, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. So correction in the church should always be done to bring the person back to the, uh, you know, uh, to the right uh, perspective uh, and not to crush them. No point in, you know, disciplining someone to, uh, to an extent where they just uh, feel so guilty and so ashamed that they completely go away from God. You know, where they are so, so overcome with a sense of guilt that they feel, oh, you know, a person like me doesn't deserve to be anywhere near God or anywhere near the church, and they literally go go back into the world. So discipline should never, ever cause a person to go back into the world. Discipline should always be done, church discipline should always be done in such a way that people will feel ashamed of what they have done, but they will also feel hope that if they come back, God will restore them. And if they come back, they will be loving believers who will re-welcome them and once again, you know, be willing to uh, respect them and have fellowship with them. So only when, when people feel this hope, they will come back to the church. So he says, do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Okay, so this is a very useful piece of advice that he gives regarding uh, how church discipline should be handled. Coming to the last few verses, uh, he says, uh, verse 16 is a beautiful prayer, which we can actually pray over ourselves, you know, in our own situations. He says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. So, uh, you know, he's saying this because the Thessalonians are a church who have undergone a lot of persecution and who are still, you know, even uh, currently at that point of time, uh, when, when, when he wrote the letter, they were still uh, suffering. 
so he says uh, may the lord of peace give you peace at all times you know no matter what situation you're going through and in every way all the kinds of peace that they would require to be able to face their situations so this is a prayer that we can pray over ourselves you know even as we go through different life situations we can say lord you are the lord of peace so could you give me your peace at all times no matter what i'm facing and give it to me in every way so that whatever i require what what whatever kind of peace i require for my situation i will receive from you so this he he concludes with this prayer for them and then of course you have his final greeting he says i'm writing this in my own hand which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters he says so when people would see this particular handwriting they would know that this is a letter which has come from apostle paul and not from someone else because you had a lot of false teachings going around you would have fake letters being you know sent to the church by people who claim to be paul but are actually not paul so usually in his letters he would at least put the last sentence in his own handwriting so that people will know that this letter is not from a fake teacher but rather it is from the apostle himself so he says uh, this is the distinguishing mark in all my letters this is how i write you know so he says this is my handwriting and so in his own handwriting he says the grace of our lord jesus be with you all so with that greeting you know he concludes his um, uh, letter so uh, these are just some of the main points that we you know were able to dwell upon from uh, Thessalonians uh, so uh, if nobody has any questions then you know we can actually close uh, this semester so um, no questions right all right then in that case we'll just close with a word of prayer Lord, we just thank you so much for taking us through uh, these letters. Whatever lessons that we have learned, oh Lord, uh, all the way from uh, the letter to the Galatians right up to this last letter, uh, we pray, oh Lord, that you would bring these things back to our mind as and when we require them so that we can live as people who have been chosen by you to be sanctified by you so that one day we can also uh, share in your glory. So we pray that we will remember these lessons, apply them in our lives, uh, and uh, we will eagerly look forward to the reward uh, that we have of sharing in your glory one day. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So yes, all the best, even as you know, you're going to be finishing uh, this semester in the, in the next few days. And uh, may the Lord bless you in all of your future ministries. Uh, you have taken the effort to uh, enroll in an institution, formally go through a time of you know teaching and training because you had this desire uh, to to draw closer to the Lord, to spend more time meditating on His Word, to equip yourself. So the Lord who has seen the heart with which you have done this in His time, in His way, He will reward all that you have done. He will see to it that the fruit. Of, of, of every good deed that you're doing, you know, by faith, just like it said in Second Thessalonians. Every good deed that you are doing out of faith for him, he will see to it that it bears eternal fruit. He will do that for you because he has seen your heart. So, you know, may you all be greatly blessed uh, in your uh, future ministries. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.